Hello and welcome back to H20 Special Relativity. In this uh, little video, I want to continue with my introduction and uh, talk about the research I'm interested in. Um, so this is not strictly on the topic of special relativity, um, but you will see some of the influences of my research in the class as well as we move along. So what am I interested in and what am I working on? I work on the Large Hadron Collider. You see behind me here a picture of the CMS detector. The CMS detector is one of two omnipurpose detectors at the Large Hadron Colliders. There's also LHCB and ALICE, uh, two more dedicated experiments. The Large Hadron Collider collides protons at the highest possible energies. In some units, 13 TeV, tera electron volt um, uh, collision energy. Uh, collision happen around um, 40 million times per second in this machine when it's operational. Um, and we have made great progress in understanding nature uh, using this machine in the last about decade. Uh, the Large Hadron Collider started operating in 2009. Um, we are currently in a shutdown phase, but we hope to restart next year um, with uh, even higher center of mass energies uh, available uh, for, for our studies. Um, so why do we need a machine like this? Um, colliding particles at high energies allows us to probe the structure of matter um, like with a big microscope. And so we, we can uh, look very deeply into, into the structure of the proton. At the very same time, we can, with high center of mass energies in collisions, produce perhaps new particles, unexpected particles. We will later see E equal mc square um, as a result of special relativity. That when you have enough energy, you might be able to produce a new particle of high mass. And so that's kind of the holy grail in, in what we're trying to do. And the other thing we do here is by colliding protons and sometimes even lead ions, um, we are able to create a very hot and dense form of matter uh, similar to uh, the environment uh, after the Big Bang, and we are able to study this, this new form of, of matter. Let's see how mass and matter are being built. If you take uh, the table in front of you and you start looking in, in detail, you start seeing uh, molecules and atoms. Uh, the atoms are built out of electrons and the nuclei. The nuclei itself is built of protons and neutrons. And if you look more precisely, drill deeply into the structure, you see that a proton you know, on the surface is built out of quarks, up quarks to up quarks and a down quark. If you further investigate the structure of the proton, you see that there's much more going on. There's gluons, uh, particles holding the quarks together. And there's also bunches of quarks and antiquarks. This is by now well understood. Um, if you ask what is the mass of the proton, it's about one giga electron volts or 938 mega electron volts. Um, but where does the mass come from? The mass of the proton comes in parts of the mass from the mass of the quarks, but in most parts uh, from the uh, gluons or the um, fields which hold the quarks together. That's kind of surprising, but if you had HO2 already, you know that there's energy stored in a field and that energy again is equivalent to the mass. So the energy stored in the gluon field holding the quarks together gives mass to the proton. And this works quite well. There is a theory which describes all of this. It's called QCD, quantum chromodynamics. And you know, if you, with some assumption, you can calculate the masses of a bunch of particles. So this, this plot here shows the light hadron spectrum, which can be calculated using this QCD effect. What I'm actually interested in is the mass of elementary particles. So this discussion so far uh, was a brief overview on how uh, composite particles like your table becomes massive. But how does a quark itself acquire mass? How does an electron acquire mass or a muon and a tau? This picture here shows you all known elementary particles. Um, we can put them in three boxes, quarks, those are the particles the up quarks and the down quarks we found in the proton. The electron um, makes, uh, together with the proton, makes a hydrogen atom. There's neutrinos, uh, those are called leptons. 
And then there's force carrier. And we just met the gluons, but there's also the photon, the W and the Z boson. And the W Z boson, they are themselves also mass, uh, massive particles. How do they acquire mass? The answer was found by us about eight years ago with the discovery of the Higgs boson, a new particle. And the underlying theory explains how particles acquire mass. And so basically solved, right? Not quite. So this is really uh, mysterious to see how different the masses of those elementary particles actually are. You see this on this logarithmic table here. Uh, again, here are our friends, the down quark, the up quark, and the electron. And if you compare this, for example, with the heaviest known elementary particles, the top quarks, you see many, many orders of magnitude different here. So how does this actually work? Um, and then you see some of the bosons, the force carriers are massive. Others, like the photon and the gluons, are massless. The answer to this was the Higgs mechanism. Um, and a very simple explanation how the Higgs, uh, the Higgs mechanism actually works for fermions, for those quarks or the electron, for example, is given in this cartoon. Um, so the idea is that a field fills all of space. It's basically a property of the vacuum. And then you travel as an elementary particle through this vacuum, you interact with this field. And the stronger you interact, the more drag you kind of get. There is some sort of, you feel an inertia. And this inertia is what we, we know as the mass of the elementary particle. So there is an equivalence between how strongly you're coupled to this, to the vacuum, to the Higgs field, and your mass. And so a top quark coupled strongly to the Higgs field, while an electron only so lightly. Great. Um, so we have understood everything. So we, you know, the question is, why do we still, you know, collide protons and protons at the LHC? Um, is there anything else to be discovered? So it turns out that we have a very sophisticated theory that describes those particles and their interactions, but this theory fails to explain the observ all of the observations we have in nature. And so that is kind of the driving force behind the experiments I'm conducting right now. And so, for example, we know that there's dark matter. When we look at the rotation of stars in galaxies, we find that they don't behave um, as you would expect, simply all based on the distribution of matter in those galaxies. There must be something else out there, and that's what, since it's not visible, it's called dark matter. And those dark matter, um, that dark matter could be a particle we might be able to produce at the LHC. So that's an interesting uh, question. Um, also, when we look out in the universe, we see a lot of matter. We don't see a lot of antimatter. So there must be an asymmetry behind between how matter and antimatter is being produced. And so that is also not fully understood yet. And then there's more question. For example, those neutrinos, they're really, really light. You know, on this logarithmic scale, I had a, a cutoff. Um, and then the neutrino masses. Do neutrinos acquire mass as an electron does, as a top quark does, or is there a different mechanism? We don't know. Um, gravity is not even included in the standard model. And the fact that the Higgs boson was discovered at a specific mass, which is rather small, is also a little bit unnatural. And so there is this entire list of questions uh, and unresolved mysteries which we're trying to, uh, to answer. And the way we do this is with big cameras. So this is CMS detector, it's a similar picture as behind me. Um, it's a, you can think about it as a big camera looking at the interaction of, of the, the collision of two protons. And it starts off with around this interaction region with a pieces of silicon, which we use to track charged particles going through. We put all of this in a magnetic field. And as, if, if you uh, listen to 802 already, you know that charged particles in a magnetic field, they follow a curvature. And from the radius of the curvature, we can um, calculate the uh, momentum of those particles. And then we stop the particles in order to measure the energy. So we do this in calorimeters. And what we use here is the lead tungstate electromagnetic calorimeter and a second calorimeter for particles which are harder to stop. Um, so those are called atronic calorimeters. And then the silver part in the middle here gives the CMS detector it's, it's named, it's the, uh, the solenoid, it's a, a 3.8 Tesla superconducting magnet. 
And then we have more detectors uh, uh, there to see whether or not some particles might to escape. And we try to measure those as well. There's another very nice picture after opening the detector. You see this silver thing in the middle here is the pipe in which the protons zoom through the detector and are brought into, into collision in the very center part of it. All right, and then we take those pictures. Here's one, and this is a very a famous one. It's the Higgs candidate event where the Higgs boson might have decayed into two Z bosons, and then those Z bosons themselves decayed again into a pair of electrons shown here and a pair of muon here. And then we can use those individual particles to reconstruct the property of the Higgs boson. Here's another candidate where there's two photons being reconstructed. And again, those two photons can then be used in order to reconstruct, for example, the mass of the particle, which is the origin of those two photons. So we have done this for the last years and uh, I collected quite some data. And if we look at the entirety of the data, we can make this plot here. And what this plot here shows is the mass of the particle and the coupling of the particle to the Higgs field. And what you see, there is a linear relationship in this log log plot between those two. And that gives us some confidence that the, the elementary particle, like a muon here, like a uh, tau lepton, a bottom quark here, like a top quark here, they acquire mass through the coupling of the Higgs field. And so there's this linear relationship, the correspondence between mass and coupling to the Higgs field. Great, so we have this all uh, together and it gives us a complete theory. Again, there is a large number of open mysteries and questions we'd like to, to answer. And the way I look at this is a little is similar to you know, the exploration of uh, Christopher Columbus. So what we are trying to do is to go to higher and higher energies, to higher and higher intensities, to find out whether or not we find first hints of something new and then exploit it. So we made this discovery, we made the discovery of the Higgs boson, but whether or not this particle is really the Higgs boson is still out there. Um, we are trying to measure it with more and more precision. Um, maybe we find deviations from its expected properties to the ones we observe. Similarly, Christopher Columba, when he, Columbus, when he sailed off from Spain, um, he uh, tried to uh, reach the Indies or Asia. And in his lifetime, he never figured out that he didn't actually accomplish this. And similarly, maybe we have discovered a new particle which helps us to understand you know, more about the inner structure of particle and so forth. 